Welcome to Stories from the Trenches from the Sales Enablement Society. This is um, our latest episode, and I'm excited to be here with Rhett Living Good. Rhett, welcome to the Sales Enablement Society podcast. Thank you. It's uh, great to be on. Awesome. Um, and we're going to just kind of dive right into it today. Um, you're about six or seven in the podcast list, so I feel like we're starting to get into a great cadence with people. <laughs> Um, and being able to have these conversations and learning from what um, the different practitioners are doing out there. So, Rhett, I would love it if you would give our listeners um, some background about uh, your career and kind of how you got into enablement, and then we'll pivot into some of your hot topics from today. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I um, uh, Rhett Live and Good, and uh, you know, started out. Uh, Grew up in um, in Illinois area near Chicago, and uh, moved out west, and am now in Santa Clara, California, at Intel Corporation. So, um, my background is in engineering. So I'm actually a, an engineering nerd, I guess, and um, have worked at Intel and um, some other companies for many years, and have worked in um, engineering and marketing and sales and operations and services and, and a bunch of different groups. Um, my kind of my career path has been doing startup um, operations inside of a big company. So I guess that's how I would um, uh, summarize myself. But currently I manage our uh, global uh, partner uh, programs um, at Intel um, on the enterprise side. And um, you know what, what does that mean? Well, we have um, we have half a million partners at Intel because we don't sell anything direct to the end user. So it's, um, it's quite a model and we, we tier our partner programs and um, obviously we have different um, focuses on the different partner programs. We're going to get into that a little bit later, but just kind of give, give you a background on what I do here in, in California every day. Yeah, that's great. And I, you know, I find it so fascinating that A, you come from an engineering background, right? Which is um, I don't know if it's different or not, to be honest, because I feel like we all stumble into uh, enable, enablement somehow during our career. So I'd love to just hear kind of what the pivot point was for you in your career before we uh, dive into the partner enablement track, um, as we talked about prior to the call. But what was the flipping point from being in, you know, the operations side potentially into the actual enablement role for you? Yeah, so I think that the pivot point, um, you know, it's uh, it, it was a little bit on the selfish side. I, I, um, I noticed on the operations side there were there were lots of people that were the same um, level that I was, and you know I was pretty good at operations. But you know, as the years went on and I saw who who got promoted, I was, I was you know, in the in the middle of a pack in operations, but when it came to enabling and working with customers and, and doing um, more product management type things, um, that's where I always gravitated to and I, I would win awards in that area. So I, I actually moved to that area and was able to move um, you know, up in the organization faster by, I would say, using more of the of the people skills and the technical skills. So as much as I started off on a very heavy technical track, um, yeah. I found out that that combination you know, got me farther. So anyway, that was, that was the transition point. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, in part because I think we are seeing that combination of kind of the analytical and the people uh, skills is, you know, that skill set is what we're seeing a lot of clients that are interested in as well from an enablement perspective, because I think we're all trying to make sure we, we bring in the metrics and the data into what it is that we're doing. So that's fascinating. Yeah. And I would say, you know, even in, in, in my job, I mean, you know, I, I go anywhere from you know, talking to the chief information and chief technology officer and making sure you, you know, speak at that level and hold their interest all the way down to working with an engineer on code. Right. So right. <laughs> it's, it, it's uh, the, the days are never the same. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so that's great and some, some awesome context for our listeners as well. I, I'd be curious to kind of now jump into partner enablement. And can you tell us a little bit about, you know, um, I think most of us know Intel that are probably listening, but can you tell us a little bit about the depth and breadth of partner enablement at Intel? Because that was really fascinating for me as I learned about that from some of our pre-calls. Pre 
Yeah, so Intel, um, as you know, we make uh, kind of building blocks for the, uh, for, the, for the IT industry. We have uh, 30 very large customers and then half a million partners that we team with that resell our product to the to the end user and the end user being whether that's a you know a business person or, or a consumer um, so we we tier the, the the partners we've got you know software partners and hardware partners and they're you know large medium and small um, we have them in 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 different countries and um, we also do them by different product lines so lots of different groups it is very complex matrix management web and I would say that you know that we're always always adjusting the partner programs. So um, we try to set annual goals and then look at those quarterly. But I will say that the programs kind of come and go, um, especially as the market changes so quickly. So the partner program is is has been around at, at Intel for a long time. But I would say it's it's always changing, especially with some of the very large changes in the last five years in terms of how people, you know their business going, you know, on online and on the web um, has really changed a lot of how we interact with the with the partners. Yeah, that's great. So I know we, we talked about some numbers, but how many partners do you estimate that you're working um, with at any, you know, given time for Intel? What does that look like? Yeah, so total with all the teams, it's probably there's probably 10 to 20,000 partners we work with on a on a regular basis in the programs there's you know several hundred thousand maybe even half a million but i would say you know there's a very very long tail of of passive partners that literally come for uh technical information and maybe some marketing and sales programs that are are you know kind of out of the box or online so we really don't have anybody that that touches them um, but it's it's definitely thousands of partners that uh, that we work with at any one time got it and I would just love to kind of dive in so you know a lot of people listen to the podcast to understand um, what works really well for you what you had successes with or what you would warn people away from you know maybe maybe treading carefully on different things so I'd be curious to know what are some of the you know things that pop out to you about what somebody should be focused on when they're doing partner enablement. Um, if they're setting it up both for the first time or if they're fairly mature, kind of, would you have different um, recommendations or stories for them about things that they they should be aware of? Yes, and I think you know it's interesting you bring that up. When when we look at the partners. You know, you, you go out initially, you do your research, who are the big ones, who moves the most product, all those types of things. What I found is that's good um, as a starting point, but then you need to go out and uh, you need to figure out what I call the willingness to partner is for your partners. And surprisingly, some of the largest partners have, have no interest in, in partnering with, with Intel at all. And even some of the ones that move the largest amount of product, they kind of got it and don't see a need to do, to do the partnering, which is fine because it allows us to put resources on partners that I would say have, we have a closer joint goal. So I think understanding the strategy and the goals of the partner, you need to start there on whether or not it's going to be a good match, if you will. Yeah, I love that, especially the part about it, it may not always be the largest one, right? The largest partner, but the most willing to work with you it sounds like you know and to and where there's opportunity yes and i'll, I'll give you an example so I, yeah that'd be great back here so an example is um we are getting ready to launch a um a pretty technical uh product it's a it's a software product and it takes some some good technical expertise and we've gone out and actually interviewed the partners and and found ones that have have the strong engineering expertise and are passionate about it, those partnerships are going very, very well. Um, the ones that are not going well are the ones that have big names but perhaps have more focus, in this case, on a business man and don't have the engineering expertise and are really not interested in what we're doing. And those are are, are very difficult conversations. So I guess, you know, in rolling out the different products, we're careful to make sure we match up 
what we're trying to do at Intel with what the partners really are trying to do. And if they're really trying to do something else, sometimes it's better to just not engage in this product round or maybe you engage in the future. Yeah, I think that that's something that's great, right, to suss out and to understand. And also, I would assume, too, it's like it's no hard feelings. It's just where you're at and where, you know, somebody else is at at any given time, right, or their capability set and what's yes. needed. And the other thing that I found is when we start out with the partner program, we actually start out with what we call a two-year plan. And some people call it the North Star plan, which we try to do three mm -hmm. years, but it's even difficult to do two years. And the reason we do that is I've found that, at least in the IT industry, the people that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis change about every 18 months, the entire executive staff. It's so volatile. So okay. even if you've got the perfect plan, it might change because you've got new players coming in midstream in your project. So uh, the longer term plans and the ability to have flexibility is, is something, it, it's difficult, but it's something you've constantly got to look at because there's no such thing as what I call a static partnership these days. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think we're probably all seeing that across many streams of what we do. So how do you um, kind of enable your organization, your teams to flex and change, you know, because you have to be adaptive, right, in that kind of a model and also know that things are going to change. So how do you approach that? Yeah, the way we approach that is similar in engineering where we have these rapid development models where instead of doing big releases a few times a year, we do very, yeah. very quick ones. We're doing the same idea with our marketing and sales programs or our, our partner programs. So we've got a rapid model where we look out weeks and months and we have goals that we're going to hit very, very quickly. And that allows us to move forward um, and, and get things accomplished versus just doing long-term plans that end up either never starting or changing all the time because of reorganization. So I call it kind of the, the rapid partner model where you really go for some really quick goals and you get everybody committed and it's something fast and focused and that seems to work very well in, in, this, in these chaotic times. Got it. That, that makes a lot of sense um, and we're seeing you know, some similar patterns across uh, customers and I think really enabling people to do that, you know, coming from some different organizations can be harder than others, but it sounds like you've got a model down, which is very, that, that's awesome. Yes, and, I, you know, for the listeners out there that are like, hey, you know, we've got really big long-term projects and they, right. take a long, they take a long time, I'm not saying get rid of those. I'm saying absolutely you want to drive to those for your, back to my two-year goal, but you better have some intermediate points in there of success because if all you have is long term, I think that is difficult in this day and age to do. Yeah, people's attention spans don't go beyond two or three years right now, right? <laughs> they, they've really gone beyond six months. but yeah. Yeah, Exactly. Quarter by quarter. Yes. Um, yeah, totally. So I'm also curious of are there, um, if when you're first setting up kind of a partner model or potentially it's a new partner, what are the key things that you make sure are first or forefront before maybe diving into um, uh, anything else with depth? So like what are those kind of some of those topic or subject areas that you feel like has to be covered before you can keep moving? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the key thing, uh, you know, starting off on a good partnership is you have got to have somebody who owns the partnership or is your key contact um, at the partner. And what I mean by that is if you don't have somebody you can pick up the phone and get a response in 24 hours, it's, it's going to be a difficult partnership. And here's some red flags where the person that is the partner manager or partner director or head partner person has a hundred partners they're dealing with, right? Probably yeah. not going to go well. Um, the other one is they're either too senior or it's you find out it's the summer intern that's your main contact. You, <laughs> have, you need to have someone that has got key relationships and experience in the company so they can get stuff done. Just like 
you as a partner manager in you know at, at Intel, you know I've got contacts and networks, and that's how I get things done, and that's where right, I yeah. give the right. It, it, that's how yeah, it goes you, both ways. If I, if I, you set up that way, yeah, yeah. So that's why you know in companies I always see people with very um, senior and diverse backgrounds make very very good partner managers, partner directors, uh, the, whatever you want for the title there, but you need yeah. to have the kind of, I mean, that's what partnership is. You've got to add some value in there, and if you're really just, um, you know, showing up at a few meetings, you're not going to be able to move too many projects along, so. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's fascinating. We were also, we were talking to one of our um, customers who, they have a lot of partner channels as well, and one of the people that was in charge of one of their large partners, he said, and I thought this was also a very um, fascinating point that we don't talk about a lot. He said, you know, there will always be a natural tension between partnerships, and that's super healthy. Um, and I thought that was really interesting to point out about a partnership, that it's not meant, you know, to be kind of like you said on both ends, but it's not, um, it's not meant to also just be like a really nice relationship necessarily, you know, like yes. uh, there, there's a natural tension that comes with that. And he said, a lot of my job is balancing the tension. And I found that really fascinating. Do you run into that at Intel with your partners? Yes, I think so. I mean, they, you know, the, the partners have lots of folks they can work with. And, you know, the key yeah. thing is you want to make sure that working with you you know, makes <laughs> makes them the most money and is also the easiest for them, right? So I I, I call it um, you know um, uh, I call it reducing the friction. Um, yeah. So uh, I think the 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 closer you can get to frictionless and um, you know keeping the main goal, the, the reason why we're partnering, so bo both of us uh, 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 you know move forward and and get better results. So if it's one of those things where we see that we're not getting better results or there's lots of friction, then then you need to really look at the partnership and decide whether you want to keep it going or, or make some big changes to improve it. Yeah, that makes sense. And, um, you know, I know in some of the work that's being done, it's, in part it's because everybody's got different, or a lot of people, a lot of different businesses have different um, year ends, right, and quarterly goals and processes that they run internally. So how do you kind of navigate all those complexity? I find that fascinating, right? You're navigating complexity on an Intel side, and you're navigating complexity on your partner side, and you guys, and everybody's navigating then the complexity on the end customer side. So, how do you look at that ecosystem? Yeah. So, on the on the Intel side, we've got in the matrix management, we've got partner teams. So, we've got people who, for instance focus on global system integrators, people who focus on um, independent software vendors, so they're kind of expertise in a certain domain. And then we also have the uh, country or region or geography structure where they've got expertise, you know, in a particular country or geography. Mm -hmm. And that really allows the geography, you know, that at the end of the day, has um, you know has to, has to deliver the numbers, if you will. They can team with those those specific partner groups, and then you can get good matches of what makes sense in the different geographies. And we found that you you know having that expertise, you can you can pick the right mix. So you're not having either the geographies wanting everything, or you've got the wrong partners in the wrong countries. If that makes sense. Yeah, and it's obviously, as you said, highly matrix with Intel, so there's a lot of different factors that you have to take into account, I imagine, when you're creating something or partnering, at least with your business, to help enable the different partnerships that they need to keep going. Yes, and and the other thing is from a, from the different product lines or product divisions, you know, we, we pick the partners then that that are covered and you know usually at plan time if we find some new partners that need coverage we'll either go off and do some trials before we get the partner team to pick them up or they'll try them out and then suggest that they're good partners for us so there is a lot of it's good to have different views and, and vantage points on that stuff and that's kind of how we do it but there is you know quarterly reviews a plan process I mean with right. 
you know, with matrix management, the, 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 the penalty you pay is that there are lots of meetings and you do need to think and do lots of communication. If you, if you don't have that set up, think, you know, the old train rolls off the track, right? <laughs> Um, well, yeah, and I was going to ask about that because it sounds like a lot of even relationship management, right? It's yes. more like what sellers are doing. So how do you, you, you know, there's lots of calls, uh, as you just said, but how else do you kind of manage having to know so many people, manage that internally so that you can help enable? Yeah, so for the partnership, what we, what we do is um, we you know, there's, there's the person that kind of owns the partnership overall, and, and they're the main person. But for them to maintain the relationships and know everything that's going on at one time it gets to be overwhelming. So what we do is we've got, um, we've got champions. We basically pair up people within the partner company with, with the Intel employees, and then they've kind of got, that's their key contact in there. And that seems to work really, really well because obviously if we've got, two teams of software engineers, one on the partner side, one on the Intel side working together. They can work together, get a lot of the stuff done. We don't have to have the marketing and sales people in all those meetings, right? In fact, they probably don't need to be in any of the meetings. They just want to know what the outcome is. So that's how you streamline it. I call it the, the birds of a feather. You, you want to get the, the, the birds with <laughs> the same color feathers together, and then that's how you keep the meetings down so it doesn't get crazy. That makes a lot of sense. So I'm curious now, um, in our final few minutes that we have together, what would be, you know, the points that you would want somebody know, to know about partner enablement if they're going into it for the first time or if they're trying to mature it in an organization? What are some of the lessons that you've learned along the way? Yeah, so I think the, the, the lessons I've learned along the way is you want to take a, a balanced approach. I mean, everybody comes from a, a certain background. So I, I came originally from an engineering background, so I know that my bias is around interest in technology. Um, however, people might come from sales and be very focused on, quote, hitting the number, or maybe marketing, where they're really into getting messages or doing launches. So understanding what your bias is, what, what I try to do is, is balance my approach so I'm not always just you know, interested in pushing the technology agenda, but I also realize that on the business side, there's sales and marketing goals as well as operational goals. So I right. think, you know, really getting that, that, that balance in there and looking on that. The, the other thing I think is really spending time building relationship and what I call, I call it finding the right person at the partnership. Um, <laughs> okay. You know, yeah. people, unfortunately, if you find the right person, they might change or leave. It's so, <laughs> so many changes these days. I, I try to find two, three, four people that are really the folks that I call the, 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 the doers, the, the folks that get, that get things done. And I've found through the years that there are 20% do 80% of the work. And I, that might be a little bit of an exaggeration. But right. um, if you can find those people, um, those are the people you want to spend the, the, the long-term relationships is. And then the other ones, you may have to work with them to get things done. But a lot of those come and go for a variety of reasons. So that's kind of my two things. It's the relationship and really looking at it from a balanced lens, which is hard to do sometimes because everybody's got their own bias. And I know what my bias is, so I'm kind of <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when, I look at the, when I look at the different projects. <laughs> yeah, so A, figure out what your own bias is, and then B, yeah. try, to, try to balance that out, right? Yes. Yeah. So, for instance, I'll bring somebody, um, like in, in finance, who's uh, you know, an expert in doing contracts, um, and I, I won't do the, even though I've done contract negotiation for many years, I'll bring in a contracts expert, because I, I know that's not my expertise, and things change all the time, and yeah. you know, if we need a privacy lawyer to know all the privacy laws, I... I, I can't keep on track of all that stuff. So I, you got to realize what your shortcomings are and, 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 and ask for help. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I think that's such a salient point, I think, to kind of to wrap up on as well, because we're going to have people that are in smaller companies and in larger companies. And I think, you know, in smaller companies, you don't always have that ability to access somebody. And yet, um, what I've found, because I, I also run a small company, is, is the awareness around the fact that you may not be the best and to flag it and say, I might need some help or somebody else to review this before we decide to do it because it's not my strength. It's such an invaluable thing to do. And then 
to your point, at a much larger organization where you have the resources, you know, I'm sure you have the ability or you're making the, the time to bring those people in. I think there's different lessons at different levels of size of organization that that can be a really important point. Yes, and even even a big company like Intel, we use third parties or outsource or right. whatever you want to call it all the time. In fact, I constantly, for instance, we might need to do um, an online marketing campaign where we generate marketing qualified leads. We would bring in a third party to do that. We jointly fund it between Intel and the partner, and we would have an expert run that program for us. I wouldn't run that myself or run around and try to get another Intel group. So I think even you know today with you know, so many things you can get as a service. Yep, <laughs> it totally. Really, as a small or medium company, you can act just like a large company. And, and as a large company, we do the same thing. We don't have all these departments like we used to anymore. Right. Either. We do, you know, it's so much quicker and probably less expensive. And, you know, we need it for a few months, and then we don't need it. So there's yeah. To, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, I do the same as a small company. So I think that's a great point because when it's of a value that's enough that it warrants having somebody come in and review it, or you know, bringing in outside help for a certain amount of time, it makes a lot of sense because it enables your business to be more flexible and agile as well, which I think is what we're all trying to keep up with, both small and large today, with yeah. the rapid change that we're going through. Yeah, it's that whole you know, time to market or time to money. And it is, <laughs> you know, I tell people, it's easy to go slow. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. I know. Sometimes I wish we were back there. It's like, wow, that would have been so nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's very easy to go slow. If I tell people, let it go slow, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, um, this has been a great conversation. I appreciate you being on um, our podcast for the Field of Enablement Society, um, and I appreciate the wisdom that you have. Um, in order to wrap up, can you just tell people if they want to get in touch with you, do you have an online presence or anything that you – Engagement. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, um, I'm 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 on Twitter. Um, it's it's under you know Rhett Live and Good or LinkedIn. Uh, Rhett Live yeah. and Good is probably the best. Or I could even you know give out my email. It's Rhett.LiveandGood at Intel.com. So um, happy to hear from anyone, and especially those of you working on partners. Uh, good good luck, and as I always tell people, get lots of sleep. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Rhett. Yes. Thanks. Have have a good one. You too. Yep. Bye.